Nightline is brought to you by the Dever Team, your source for New Smyrna Beach real estate and everything else New Smyrna Beach. Go to www.thedeverteam.com and call UCF alumni Travis Dever for all your New Smyrna Beach needs. 386-690-1636. That's 386-690-1636. Welcome to UCF Nightline, your source for UCF sports and former player information. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fegley coming to you from the 1148 Studios, and this is Nightline 223 from the award-winning Nightline Sports Network. Joining me as always... Trace Trolka. Hello, everyone. Taking a look at the linebackers as our position reviews continue, we're talking with new tight end signee Zach Marsh Wojan, breaking down men's basketball's inconsistent week with our insider Ben Stout. From FTU to UCF, we continue our look at 50 years of men's basketball. A hell of a weekend for softball and baseball. We're talking about the men sweeping Auburn with former Knight Kelly Brown. One-on-one with Terrence Plummer of the XFL's Tampa Bay Vipers. And when will KZ be cleared to play? That is an Ask Nightline. But first... All right, get out the brooms. UCF baseball goes on the road to eighth-ranked Auburn and sweeps the SEC powerhouse. The Knights dominate with stellar pitching and big bats. We'll be talking about it with our new insider, Kelly Brown, in just a bit. Plus, softball rules the Tennessee Vols. A great weekend on the Diamonds. Uh, but let's th- let's start w- talking about football because there's football news. I think that's where we should go first. Can I point out something that you were talking about right before you recorded? This is episode... 223 on 223 2020 yes that's pretty cool it is uh jeff uh, allen our our guy that does the aac report text or uh, texted me or emailed me earlier in the week and told me that and he said i should go buy a lottery ticket i did not did you go buy a lottery? i probably should have but i i I've never won the lottery any time that i've spent <laughs> hard-earned money on it so <laughs> it's like uh you know I, I can use my my dollars for other things. Than you might have won two dollars and twenty three cents. <laughs> two, yeah, two hundred dollars twenty three cents and and whatever. I don't know. But this baseball. Before we get back to the football, I mean, this is just huge. It I is mean, huge. You know, you're looking at a possibility here. Men's and women's tennis are already ranked. It is baseball and softball should be ranked this week. These four programs will be ranked this in is just what, a few days. This is what Danny White said from the beginning that he wanted to do here at UCF. I've said this I don't know how many times, but I remember that, and I'll never forget that statement that he made. I think it was during his opening press conference when they, you know, uh, brought him out and said this is our new AD. He said he wanted to make this a, a top 25 school in all sports. And he's well on his way to doing that. Very, very close to doing that. It's uh, And when you look at, if not this season, you look back on previous seasons of the different sports that have been ranked, and it's not unusual for baseball or softball in years past to be ranked, but certainly we've talked about it. The tennis programs being ranked is just incredible. So uh, hats off, and we'll talk more about uh, both of their Absolutely, weekends yeah. uh, coming up. So the schedule, we knew the uh, the opponents. Uh, right. We didn't necessarily know the order and the dates and, and, and all of that. And still some of it. I, I think that there's one game in particular that could be moved. There's there's rumor of a game being moved because of the short time. Yeah, the Georgia Tech game. The Georgia Tech game could be a noon game, suppo- or, I mean a, a Friday game uh, instead of a Saturday game or something like that. So, But it's officially confirmed uh, that the opener will be on the Friday night, which I think for fans, at least it's better than it being on the Thursday night, right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. A lot of folks did not like that Thursday commitment and certainly going to be a lot of exposure. It's so funny, right? 
you go back a couple of seasons and North Carolina was doing well in the ACC and it looked like a good opponent to to ink to a contract and then North Carolina falls apart and then it's, well, UCF doesn't play anybody. Oh, well, lo and behold, Mac Brown's at North Carolina. Uh, they're probably right. going to be a top 25 ranked team. Highly touted quarterback. Pretty good matchup. And uh, remember how we were all, we, we kind of thought that too uh, when they signed North Carolina to play and they were good you know back then when they actually signed that contract and now they're they're starting to be good again so uh it'd be a good win for either program on that Friday night absolutely right but for North Carolina home to come to a UCF that would be a big win for them so there will be a lot at stake for them and no one will mock UCF's opening game well if successful in defeating North Carolina I think that there's more in it for us. I think it's more important for us to win that game than it is for them personally. We still have that. We have the, uh, one streak left out of all this. The home winning streak. And our streak is, is the home winning streak. And I think that that is hugely important uh, because that's our one streak left that we have out of this stuff. So uh, I just I feel like it's very, very important to win all of our games at home. I, I mean, it, there's nothing worse than than somebody coming into your house and beating you, and we've we've kept at our house for the last you know two seasons, three seasons, especially in a home schedule of twelve game or a, a schedule of twelve games with seven home games. Right, war on I four and Black really, Fridays in Tampa. Yeah, but it's really a home game yeah, too. Well, so there's there's eight home games really. And for fans, we talked about it when the team played at FAU last season. An opportunity for statewide fans to to right. see the program close and. You know, UCF is Tampa's hometown team. So right. we need to do the same exact thing that we did, uh, you know, for the the bowl game over there and, and go fill the place. As the schedule stands right now, and think about this, if Georgia Tech has moved from a Saturday to a Friday, right now there are four weekday games. The home opener on the Friday night, that conference opener on the road on a Thursday night, and then Friday night at Memphis, and then Black Friday. So if that Georgia Tech game moves, you'd have five of the 12 games either on a Thursday or a Friday. Yeah, I mean, I'm okay with that because these games are the away games that are that are the ones that are on Fridays and Thursdays and stuff. If more of these games were home games and they were on Fridays, I really wouldn't like that nearly as much. Well, and I don't think Danny White wants that either. Yeah, you know, the certainly. one is okay. Um, I think they the trade opener. that one because they want the TV exposure on right. ESPN. Right, and and that w- I mean that's fine with with all the rest of them, but. It just, you know, for people that are local that are going to go out there to the game um, and tailgate and, you know, drink a bunch of beer and stuff like that, it's hard to go to work, you know, the next day if it's a Thursday game or whatever. Or Friday, you know, you want to get off work so you can go tailgate, you know, so taking off time from work and all that stuff, I mean, is is kind of a bummer. But (laughs) so I would much rather them be on Saturday, but... Like I said, I'm good with these games being on the weeknights uh, away. The only one that I will take off, I will not be going to work September 25th. I guarantee that. The 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 game after the night after that, or the day the morning after that game, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, the Thursday game. I won't be going to work on Friday. So uh, the immediate observation on fans is it's nice that UCF plays no road games down the stretch there with the Florida A and M game at home, Temple at home which means you don't have to go to what could be chilly or cold Philadelphia in the month of November. How about Cincinnati, November 21st? But it sets up nicely on a Saturday. I don't know that ESPN wants to do game day again so quickly, but you see a scenario, don't you, where... They sure could, because... These teams could collide. Absolutely. And remember, with UConn out of the league coming up, Shortly, and certainly not for football, there are no more divisions. It's one big 11-team scrum, and the first, uh, the top two teams will play in that American Conference championship game. This one right here could not only be for who wins the American regular season, which program might host the uh, championship game, which is scheduled for Saturday, December 5th. And back to that schedule, Florida A&M, Temple, Cincinnati, at the Cows, AAC championship game, you could not leave home in florida after october 31st awesome i mean that's That's crazy right and that game could be the the same game that's going to happen for the american championship as well so 
Uh, I mean, I could easily see that Cincinnati and and UCF being the top two teams in the in the entire league. So, what on the schedule? We talked about this this morning on Nightline the morning after on uh, ESPN five eighty Orlando. Little shameless plug, as you know, I love to do. Um, what game in that whole thing worries you the most in the entire season schedule here? What what stands out to you, or what worries you the most? Uh, all right, I'll go through. Uh, certainly, I think UCF, I agree with you, you want to protect the home slate, and so that North Carolina game is pivotal. Uh, you don't want to stumble in your home opener. So I, I think that game is certainly teams of uh, considerable matchup, uh, you know, uh, highly touted quarterbacks. So that one just concerns me because, you know, you the way your team is in week one, and it's equal for both teams, but, you know, you're not as gelled as you're going to be down the line. So that's a big early season uh, test. I'm not as concerned with at Georgia Tech. I actually favor moving it to Friday because of the quick turnaround time. East Carolina, we know what that quarterback can do. Uh, right. You know, so I'd hate to see that ECU game be like the Tulsa stumble. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, I'm not as concerned with Houston because I think they have quarterback questions. But at Memphis, remember, they're, de- they're defending American Conference champions. And you look and you say... Well, UCF has an open date prior to that. Well, that's good, except when you look at Memphis's schedule and you realize, oh, by the way, they have an open date too. So, yeah, so on everybody's going to be fresh. October 1st, Memphis will have played at SMU and then return for that Friday night game, another primetime showcase in which they welcome UCF. UCF has dominated that a series uh, since what 1990, the yeah. last loss in a well, bygone era, but that's still a game you got to win on the road. Yeah, I mean, it, there's always time for that to happen. You know, um, one of these days, Memphis is going to get us. They, I mean, think about was it last year or the year before? Up, it was the year before up in Memphis. Nearly got us. Yeah, yeah, very, very close. Well, a to couple of times, us. American Conference Championship game. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's a couple of times right. that in there. So. To me, that one is the one. I, I, I originally I thought the Houston game originally, but then I realized, oh wait, their quarterback's like not there anymore, transferred somewhere. So I think that's that's going to be an issue there. Uh, but that Memphis one, the Memphis one is the one game on the schedule that really really worries me. Not that one season in which there were three losses on the road, as we know, as we've well documented, make for a trend. I certainly don't think that makes for a trend for Josh Heupel or for Dylan Gabriel. Absolutely not. But it is a question that you want to see how they perform in these road games, which are not counting the game in Tampa, rivalry games. So, you know, records don't mean anything, but you'll still have a strong home contingent for that game. You know, want to see how they play at Houston, at Memphis. Short turnaround, even if it's Friday. Well, we can't short. get embarrassed by a team like Georgia Tech on the road either. Can't take them lightly. They are I mean, still from the ACC. Thank goodness it's not the triple option anymore. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, they're the bottom tier of the a- ACC as well. So The Florida A&M game moving from September uh, to November 7th is, is reminiscent, right, of the SEC where they bury these – Cupcake games. No disrespect to Florida A and M. They had a great season last year. I think what their only regular season blemish was to UCF, but it's positioned there. But you know what stood out to me about where it was is that when it was early in the season, with the red shirt rule, you can play up to four games. That was a game in September where you gave guys some playing time. Right now, you don't. Ha- you, you can still do that then. Right, right, but you don't have it early. Well, this is a game where you give some people a rest, though. Um, that's what's going to be very important in that time right there. And that's why I love that game where it's at, is because you can give some of your players, you know, you can still get in some of those guys that don't play as often, but you can give your your guys a rest that are out there all the time and that are going to be pretty banged up by that point of the season. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be somebody that will need a rest by that time. I think it is as favorable a schedule as you you could have. You know, you certainly don't want to be knocked for playing lightweights. And we know, because we're involved with the American and it's not national pundits and media, we know that games with, you know, Tulane and Temple and Cincinnati, boy, you're glad you have those games at home. 
Uh, you don't want to play those. Now, they d- soundly defeated Temple on the road, but Cincinnati was a stumble, and crying out loud, they nearly lost to Tulane uh, yeah. late in that game. Yep. It's good to have all three of those at home. And you just got to think, with another year of development with Dylan Gabriel, just there's no reason. I mean, it's not my expectation, but there's no reason that they can't win every one of these games. You know, that's absolutely true. Uh, posted... I'm not going to call it like that again this year, though. I guarantee oh, you're, that. you're you're no, downgrading gonna, your prediction. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to do that again because you know I I just feel like that I will, I'll get too much trouble for that if I try to say we're good. I mean, I would love uh, nothing more than than this team to go 13 and 0, but. I asked on Twitter at UCF underscore Nightline, what's your prediction for regular season wins? Ready? 48% of respondents, 12 and 0. Yeah. 33%, well, 11 and 1. So the majority picked tw- win them all? 17%. Okay. 10 and 2. And then I asked, I, I wrote, you know, because Twitter allows you four choices. So I just wrote nine or fewer. That was just 2%. And of course, UCF coming off the 9 and 3 season, 10 and 3 overall with a Gasparilla Bowl win. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that it's going to be anywhere close to that, but the the, the nine or fewer. Uh, but you could be... see, I mean, if you were going to say what could be, you know, what could be a loss, North yeah. Carolina could be a loss. Uh, it better not be. Uh, at Memphis, not at be. Memphis could be a loss. I, I mean, okay, you remember how people were freaking out last year and how upset I got? I'm going to be freaking out if they lose this North Carolina game at home. <laughs> I the will alarm bells freak will sound. the heck out. I will, yeah, uh, it will not be pretty. The nightline the morning after after that game will be, you got to tune in for that one. But, you, that but don't you think I, I mean, going in it. that it is a game that they could lose based on how no, well they, North Carolina played in the their bowl game and they the could, rebound. but they won't. They won't. It's home field. We we have to win it in the bounce house. Like, what, what is your guess for what the line will be? Let's see if we will remember this. When I we mean, get there. I think that we'll be favored. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't see why not. Well, I, I think mean, you'll be favored, but by how much? A touchdown, probably. See, I maybe think maybe they'll give it to us by three, even for yeah, being I, at home. I think it'd be something like three and a half, something I, like that. They were seven and six, though. I mean, they were seven and six. They played in the military bowl. I mean that that's not they weren't, you know, slaying the giants. Oh, I gotcha. They weren't like, you know And maybe it's the ESPN hype machine, you know what they like to right. do. Nebraska's gonna be a top twenty five team and, and then they're not. And, and, then and so maybe they're this is gonna be bowl eligible. Maybe this will be just a overhyped there's always right. three, four, five, six teams that the pollsters and ESPN overhype. And maybe Mac Brown's North Carolina Tar Heels will be one of those teams that they overhype based on the performance of their true freshman quarterback in 2019. Yeah, so we'll see. We'll see. I mean, I just so you look at that I'm game not asking is you to predict imperative. wins. What you look at it? What's your? How many could they lose? I'm only really worried about one, and that's what I said earlier. I'm worried about that Memphis game for some reason. It always Memphis always worries me, and away at Memphis, we were so close to losing that one, and pulled it out of our rear ends with that fourth and, you know, whatever play it was that, that went 70 freaking yards. No worry about Cincinnati. It's at home. I mean, I really don't worry nearly as much about games at home because I feel like the environment that that team is in, in that stadium, that stadium is special. It's special. I don't care what anybody says. It might be small. It might be a frying pan, blah, blah, blah. It might be an erector set. It may be made out of aluminum. That place has vibes. Big time. Vibes. Big time. It just does. There are places on the earth, especially in sporting events, in stadiums, have their thing. That's true. That stadium has its thing. More, More than a lot of other places do. Way more than North Carolina's stadium. Way more than, than, I don't know, maybe even Georgia Tech. I don't know. It's just, it's a special place. And that place needs to be kept special. It needs to, we need to have the perfect record continuing at home. Defend your home stadium. De- defend your home field. I think that is the most important thing to do during this entire schedule. If you lose on the road, you lose on the freaking road. It's not the same as losing at home. We didn't if we would have won one of the if we would have lost one of those games at home last year, 
the freak out would have been 10 times more, I believe, than it was already losing the games on the road, personally. So to 80, me, 81% of respondents, 11 or 12 wins. Unrealistic expectations set upon the 2020 Knights again? I don't again? think so, no. I, I think one loss in that thing. I'm, I'm going to say it right now, one loss. And I'm not going to I'm not going to pick who it's going to be, but there's going to be one. At because least. it's not realistic. <laughs> that makes it simpler. To expect a team to win all of its games. It's not realistic. It's not. But it is a schedule built for it this can. team it to could. win all of its games. It could. They could. Yeah. They could, but I just feel like there's going to be one stumble. There all kinds of things happen during the football season. Luckily, we weren't really bit with the injury bug last year. You never know, though. You never know. It, it's a long season, even though it's a short season. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's long physically for the players. Um, it, it just it evolves throughout the season. I think that those, those three home games, it, four if you want to count the one in Tampa, that is going to be huge, though. And I think that if, if we're in line at that point to be – uh, in line for the for the championship of of the American and get to play in that AAC championship game, I think those games will be pivotal, and those home games will be the most pivotal. Florida A and M. I mean, you don't want to let down your guard when you play no, a I team don't think like that. I don't think they're worried about that one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I know, but I mean, it's just. It's one of those things. Things happen sometimes. Uh, that Memphis game scares me. It's the only one. I just feel like now they, I guess if, if we're playing devil's advocate with that, so I'm just talking, uh, uh, I would say that they lost their head coach as well. So, I mean, is Memphis going to be as strong this year because they lost their head coach? Could Cincinnati be stronger than they were last year because their coach stayed Mm -hmm. and they're you know it's the same thing that's been the same thing for what four or five years in a row maybe maybe even more i don't even know how many years it's been well i think fickle's been there that long long, just a couple seasons but whatever um it's you know i'm not worried about that game because it's at home we play markedly different than when we play on the road they need to to uh, change that though they need to change that going on the road and, and you know not playing as hard as they play at home just because they don't have the bounce house and the crowd right behind them it just felt like it was like that last year and a good thing about that georgia tech road game no matter when it is played uh, you have a lot of night nation within driving distance a lot of night alums and fans in georgia and atlanta and i'm not saying that it is a de facto home game no but but there's a lot it, of it won't be in that area. it won't be 200 people on a cold night in no, Tulsa it'll be not. a strong crowd yeah. that will make noise and take away a little bit of Georgia Tech's home field advantage i guarantee that you will hear the UCF night crowd uh at Georgia Tech no question so no it's 223 and believe it or not 228 is the start of spring practice that's crazy friday february 28th and that is uh, this Friday. That is this Friday. Practice number one. Media allowed 15 minutes, uh, approximately 845, says the advisory, to snap some photos, which means it's that time of year where 10 to 15 second video clips will, you know, will we'll show a Freak pass being dropped yeah. uh, or a... Uh, it, now the in, wide receivers are horrible. They can't catch anything. In fairness, <laughs> the times, and I never once recorded anything with any bias. I just capture what I see, and I don't see every pass. But it is interesting in retrospect the number of times I caught Brandon Wimbush skipping stones. <laughs> <on the practice laughs> well, I, mean, I, I feel like that's what was probably I, all happening. I'm, say, I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm not, there was no <laughs> bias there, but he was skipping stones. Uh, yeah. We are scheduled uh, to meet with the following people. So I ask you, I ask Night Nation, send it to us on uh, Twitter uh, and our, our social media channels. We're scheduled to meet with head coach Josh Heupel, Glenn Ellerby, and... Five minutes, give or take, with Randy Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that if you're lucky. What what questions do you have? Well, What's on your mind? 
I, I, we just saw Coach Heupel two weeks ago at National Signing Day, and really, we're not that far removed from the bowl game, for crying out loud. So I don't know how many things have been thought through in two months since that bowl game, but this is the opportunity. Half a dozen or so media availabilities leading up to the April 4th spring game, a 2.30 start, and they've got that big yard sale uh, preceding that at the uh, field house. I think by the time the general public is allowed to enter at 10 a.m. There will be socks only left. <laughs> All that will be left are some sweaty, old, stinky <laughs> socks. That's it. And they might be nitros. They might be a player. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they yeah, might the, be coaches. The somebody, shareholders. I know somebody wants Heupel socks. Get in at 8. To the season ticket holders can enter from 9 to 10. I wonder if 10. there will be a shacket left. Uh, oh, boy. Adam. Did you see the, the shacket that Adam got, though? The green one? That, that's uh, the, the green one from Hayden Kingston yeah. is, is where he got that. Yeah, I saw him post that's that. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. So that's what's a, on your that's mind? Official. That's an official that jacket. Official. What's on your mind for Coach Heupel, Coach Ellerby, or Coach Shannon? I'll take notes. Well, I'm taking notes. I've got a couple things for Coach Shannon. Coach Shannon. Number one, how do you replace Navell Clark? How? Okay, I can hear his answer now. Yeah. Uh, it'll be so, in so many words, none of your business. Um, your place, Neville Clark. Yeah, and, and how do you uh, replace uh, Nate Evans? That's my next one. The middle linebacker, who you know, it's the leader of the defense, the quarterback of the defense. Mm-hmm. You know, where does that person come from? Like, you know, is there somebody in mind specifically? Okay. Or uh, and then it's kind of the same thing for for Ellerby. How do you put, replace Jordan Johnson? Yeah, he's got a guy a that that was so important, you know, in, in the snap. I mean, how do you teach a guy to snap with the quarterback? Did they get together in the in the you know? Uh, I think somebody asked this. Did they get together? You yeah, know, we got asked that before on Ask Nightline question. Yeah, it's repetition, so, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's total practice. repetition. You know that they do, but I would like to hear what he had to say about that. Heupel, I don't know. I mean, it's, <laughs> Heupel, you're going to get the same stuff from Heupel that you got last year at this point. You know, oh, we're working really hard. Want to know, want to know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that's all you're going to you get. You sound from tired him, so. of his uh, Well, refrains. I mean, it, it is what but what's it is. Your, forget his answers. What's your question? What do you want to know from Coach Heupel? Well, he's not going to tell us anything, so that, it's worthless to ask him anything. It's, well, it's still fun to ask and see if you get a good, a good glare. I don't know. I strive for the glare. Maybe ask him. <laughs> maybe, th- maybe throw something weird at him that he's not expecting. Have you seen The Mandalorian? <laughs> <laughs> or like, uh, we should just throw the Ask Nightline questions at him. There you go. <laughs> I mean, Coach Heupel. Uh, at a Wade eight underscore eight. Do it. Yeah. I, I dare wants you. to know. I dare you. Oh my goodness. Who? I'll, I'll be He'd banned. Be like, I'll be banned. No, but no, but that's. I mean, a fan. You you could say a fan. Fans want to know. Fans want to know. Inquiring minds. Fans. Yeah, you could do that. You could sources say, close to the investigation. <laughs> You could say that a listener wrote into our show and asked me to ask you this question, sir. You got to put sir in there because that will make him do you, feel Do you start special. off with a sir? Do you do a double sir? Sir, Ex- a fan would like to excuse know. Excuse me, sir. sir. Excuse me, sir. That's what you have to start with and then say thank you, sir, at the end. Uh, yes. This is not going to go well. And then maybe he'll, he'll be like, well, he might give the greatest answer of all time. I mean, he may give... What's been the his greatest answer, answer of all time? Well, that's what I'm saying. He hasn't given it yet. So <laughs> We're still he waiting. may actually give an actual answer. I mean, an answer that really, I mean, he has given a couple answers, but it, it's the same stuff over and over. It's coach talk. He's, he is the master of coach talk. It's great if you're, it's great if, if the opponent's media or the opponent's coaches or whoever, the coach's wife, whoever's listening to hypo talk of the opposing team, <laughs> he's not giving anything away. He has to be a hell of a poker coach. Player. Fickle, uh, we transcribed the the presser. Um, exactly, coach Heupel wants to go one and zero this exactly. week. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure stuff like that's happening. He wants right? to play. Uh, you know, uh, whistled. You know, I mean, I've gotten, calls, I've gotten calls. I've gotten calls and emails and text messages from people in the media. Well, this was said. I heard this. What do you know about it? And and these guys were controlling betting things that asked me this. You know what I'm saying? So little things that people say. I think it was something a player said. And so literally the next day somebody was emailing me saying, hey, I'm from so-and-so. Is this got any weight or whatever? 
you know? So uh, <laughs> people are listening to that stuff, and, and Hypo is, is the king of... I mean, I bet he's a great poker player, like I said. <laughs> I, I just I feel like he's really good at that. So let him be, I guess. Let him be that. But right. I, I, I suggest throwing in a, an Ask a Nightline question well, to him well. just to see what happens. But please use the sir thing. Be yeah. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Yeah. We'll see I how mean, that goes. But no, I, I ask you, uh, we have until Friday, send in your questions. What do you want to know? Uh, and I, I mean, I think the questions like Jordan Johnson and those are questions that are on our minds. But what's something, what's a not not a, a curveball kind of question, but what's something that we're not all thinking? That's, that's a lot of times the way I go into these pressers is that I know everybody's going to ask about X. So I you know that it's something different. I know yeah. that it's going to be asked. And I try to think of what interests me. And sometimes you phrase it better and sometimes lesser. And, you know, it's hard for me to do that with people to. But I usually try to ask questions just in general when we're doing interviews. I try to I think of something with their answer. You know what I'm saying? Well, you just said this. Now, how about that? You know, uh, that's just kind of the way that I've always done it. But uh, and sometimes they're just random. Sometimes my questions are purely random. Which we all know that nobody here listening to us will will you know uh, think that that's not true. I think so. the best response to anything is when it's some impromptu thing. What was it about the food they ate? Uh, remember Gabe Davis or whoever it was yeah. dipped food in something or other? Or, or, or it was, was AK it? putting stuff ketchup on, on uh, mac and or, cheese. Oh, mac and cheese. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Hypel reacted to that was a little bit fun. Whoa! You know? yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. You mentioned Neville Clark. NFL Combine time is upon us. Uh, yeah, coming Neville's up pretty there quick. and uh, Gabe Davis. But turns out, looks like AK doesn't get an invite. Or, did that really surprise you? Uh, mm, yes and no. He wasn't at the top of of the running backs in the United States. I think there's States. a place for him, though, in the no, NFL. No, in the NFL, I, I agree there's a place. But I don't think that he is the upper echelon of running backs. He may be the upper echelon of fast, but not the upper upper echelon of running backs. Where do you put him? Do you put him in with the wide receivers? There's nothing for specialists. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In the combine, there's nothing for specialists. If he wants to make his mark, it's going to be right here at the, at pro, the, day. the pro day at the indoor practice yeah. facility. Um, and a lot of people can make their... Uh, thing right there i mean it's it's happened a lot of times people that haven't gone to the combine and can make just as big of an impact here where you're comfortable and everything else so i mean i think he has just as good of a chance there as he does here i think there's a place for him again whether that's in the nfl or a cfl or an xfl i don't know i just see some future with his speed there's a place for him somewhere i, I believe so as well i just don't I mean, I'm not surprised that he did not get invited to the combine. Now, I am surprised that, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm kind of surprised that a guy like Nate Evans doesn't get with the motor that Nate Evans has. It's just his size, maybe. Huh? Yeah. I'm surprised that he didn't get a chance. Um, he could play. I don't know if he's tall enough, but I, I think he could probably play even safety in the NFL if he's not big enough for a linebacker. So he's got a motor, though. That guy. The other thing is with this stuff, the, a lot of this is about your agent as well, getting into the combine. This is not just on your playing. Uh, so if AK doesn't have the right agent, Nate Evans doesn't have the right... I know Nate Evans did not have the right agent. Now he does. I know he, he switched agents. Uh, AK, I don't know who, who his guy is, so they may not have pushed for that. They did get him in that senior bowl or whatever it was, the rec one of those games. Um so, and I thought he was fairly impressive in that. So that's, that's another, there's all kinds of things that, um, you know, make this difficult for people. It's, it's not only, uh, what you did on the field. Yeah, true, true. Uh, you've mentioned Nate Evans a couple of times where position focuses on linebackers and he's a big loss there, uh, especially the heart and, uh, energy, passion for the game that he showed throughout the season but still a lot of talented players in the position group yeah well i mean we would all assume i think that eric mitchell probably goes into that middle linebacker spot spot um i i think but there's also young guys 
this Tatum Bethune dude is going to be special. I guarantee it. If if he doesn't have his sophomore slump, if there is one, um, he will be special. And you I know, can't wait. Maybe that's wait. a question, by the way, for Coach Heupel. I don't think his reaction will be very good. But what does he make of the concept of a sophomore slump? Yeah, that's a good good idea. Does does he put any? Does he think much of such a concept? Right. He'll probably be dismissive of it. And I don't know if it's a media generated type of question, but. I know it comes to the mind of a lot of people well, that they I mean, ask that kind of it's, question. It's a lot. not only in football or in sports, but it's in a lot of things. I mean, you it may not be your sophomore year, quote unquote, but you know if somebody has some success one year and then kind of either gets their head full or whatever, and then doesn't have the success that of the expectation, I guess, that's been put on them. That's the easiest way, I think, for somebody to have a slump you know, from year to year. It's more expectation than anything else. We've seen good things from Eric Mitchell. It gives you a good, great and deal of confidence. Eric Gilliard as well. I mean, absolutely. And Tatum Bethune. I mean, yeah, but I, I just, I really feel every time that Tatum Bethune was on the field last year, he caught my eye in one way or another. Yes, did he make some freshman mistakes? Of course he did. But there's just, there's something special about that guy. I just, I really think, I can't, and I can't wait to see. Um, and there's also, you know, there's other guys that were freshmen uh, last year that I can't think of their names right now, but they were special as well. That uh, defensive lineman, uh, I can't think of it. It happens. Um, he was a freshman. He was the Gatorade guy. The You know, can you think of it? You can't think of it either. Uh, Tremon Vor- Morris Brash. Yes. He's going to be special, too. I knew you'd get it. I think both it. of those guys. I was just watching. No. I saw you. I saw you getting it. I saw you. <laughs> I had to open my little book. Thank God where I opened the book, it was right there. It's sometimes hard to go through all of the names in your head when you're doing this. It is. Instantly. It definitely is. It's easy when you listen. You go, know, why don't they know the name? I mean, you know, when it's, you're talking. It's hard. I mean, it's not like we were thinking about him, and now suddenly we got to remember his name. Exactly. So, so. Yeah, and... I mean, you know, coaches' names. I I know I I butchered uh, a coach's name coming up here in the uh, in the uh, the tight end Zach his interview. I I butchered the the new co offensive coordinator's name. You'll you'll hear it. You'll hear it. A name a voice you will hear in that is Jeff Allen. We recorded exactly. two interviews last to, week, yes. and so you'll hear Jeff during that interview. We had a packed show. Uh, last week with the debut of our new baseball insider, so and we you know, do this this week again. We got all kinds of stuff. It's so funny. Uh, my memory now of the early days of the show is that I would think, well, how are we going to fill this in the spring and the summer? And you know, there's all sorts of people to talk to and things to talk about. So well, and that's the thing. Like I'm, you know, doing this this morning show now, and and that show. Uh, I, I kind of worry once basketball is ending, where do we go from there? But Heads we, up. we've got a couple more games. <laughs> yeah, I know uh, when you, you and Ben, we're, we're, we were talking with Ben earlier and, and I, you guys were, somebody said there's only four more games and then the conference tournament. And I'm like, Whoa, wait a second. So that's possibly five more games. <laughs> yeah, so that oh could boy, be maybe six. Yeah, tune uh, in because that's yeah. going to be interesting, folks. Now we're gonna we got all kinds of stuff. We're we're coming up with all kinds of. So stuff. So we got some more position groups. We have got the defensive line to talk about and special teams, which of course is is another interesting battle. But uh, you know that's another question uh, is uh, is the battle for a place kicker because we don't have Dylan Barnes oh, anymore. That's true too. And, uh, and you know we got we got old out of bounds. <laughs> out of bounds. Uh, yeah, he, he's he's poised though. We got with another. Big leg. We got other guys. Yeah, we got other guys. Poised with a big leg though. Too. Maybe in the shorter distances where he's actually kicking a field goal, it doesn't have as much time to arc. Mm. Do you ever do you play golf at all? I do not. No, have you ever played? I have. Were you? Did you slice? Oh, of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's basically <laughs> what he does with with his foot. Yeah, it's not something I do, so I am no yeah. good at it. Well, I I am Mister Slice. Uh, in fact, I I at one point I was turning my body and and placing the the ball in such a weird spot that like so I wouldn't slice that I was almost hitting it backwards. <laughs> it was it's it's bad. So uh, for you, golf is like boomerang. Yeah, basically, <laughs> it just comes yeah, right back to you. yeah. I, if I've had some come back to me, yes. It's funny. You hit it into a tree and it bounces right back at you. A shout out to 
at UCF, UCF's Twitter handle. Oh, wow. Who responded to us with thanks for sharing all things UCF with our community. Oh. Ah, at UCF. Wow. Give them a follow. A lot of nights follow at UCF. And we appreciate it. And they it. actually said that to us? Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. Thank you. That was, that's, I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. Uh, just ahead, we open the Ask Nightline inbox, but first we're talking with the newest Knights tight end signee only on Nightline number 223. Hey, this is Travis Dever, Kai's Real Estate, the Dever team, New Smyrna Beach. Your source for real estate and everything else, New Smyrna Beach. Proud sponsor of Nightline and Nightline Post Game Live. Call me anytime at 386 690 1636. That's 386 690 1636. Let me show you my hometown, New Smyrna Beach, UCF's favorite beach. Go Knights and charge on. Raising the bar on what to expect from your personal injury attorney is our commitment to you at Chad Bar Law. I'm Chad Barr, and as a UCF alum, I am proud to present Nightline, the morning after show, Central Florida's only call-in show dedicated to our UCF Knights every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And remember, if you or a loved one are injured in an auto accident, call us at 407-599-9036 to schedule your free consultation or visit us at chadbarlaw.com. Our clients come to us in need and leave as family. Offices Altamont Springs. Go Knights. Charge on. Before the new Knights charge onto the field, they're on the line with us. Meet the new players that will wear the black and gold in this week's Recruit Spotlight. UCF bolsters its tight end depth by inking Zach Marsh Wojan on National Signing Day. Zach joins us now on the Nightline Hotline. Zach, a big Night Nation. Welcome to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on the show. So we shall call you Woj, huh? Yeah, Woj is the name I like to go by. All right, that we will get used to. Night Nation will embrace that. Take us inside the recruiting of you. How did you get on UCF's radar? How did you know about him? Well, I'm sure you guys know uh, my coach, Alex Golish. He came from Iowa, and uh, he went over to UCF, uh, I guess, about six years ago. He recruited a running back out of Sac City, Sacramento City. So then he was looking for tight ends for UCF, calls up the head coach and finds me. So did, did you know anything about UCF before Coach Golick recruited you here? You know, I honestly didn't. All I knew about UCF was actually that um, I knew they had gone undefeated a couple of years ago, and I knew about their quarterback who had been injured. But other than that, the main thing I heard was about Taco Fall. So I wasn't really familiar, but once they told me about the program, I was really interested. All right. Well, there's been some kind of question, I, I think, with fans and media, if that 2017 season when they were undefeated and claimed the national championship, if that season was making a difference in recruiting today, did, does that make any difference to you if a team is undefeated and, and gets the national recognition that UCF does by a thing like that? I'm honestly not worried about back then. I'm more focused in the now moment. I want to go undefeated this upcoming year. I want to make the national championship this upcoming year. I'm going to do everything in my power to be able to do that. Well, Coach Golish had made a name for himself uh, with the tight ends. What was his conversation with you about a role that you may play with the 2020 Knights? Well, obviously, coming out of uh, JUCO, I'm, I'm going to be a junior. So that means I only got two years left to play. And knowing that, I needed a place that I could play right away. So he said I could play a big role in this offense. And knowing that they only had a, a six-year senior and uh, two in, uh, two freshmen, I think they might pick up somebody next year also. But knowing that they only had them, I knew I could make a big impact in the offense. Just searching Google for you, looking for tape and all that stuff, and I found that you are a three-sport athlete, or at least you were in high school. Uh, yeah, that's a lot to do. I mean, as an athlete, you must be a really good athlete, not just a football tight end. Yeah, I was um, actually a lot of people thought I was going to go big in baseball because I really I was always the four hitter. I could always say it really well, but uh, I also played basketball and really I was just all around athlete. I can I'm quick. I'm tall. I'm fast. And I feel like, honestly, that football is my best sport. Zach, you probably have to be licking your chops knowing that uh, the caliber of quarterback play here at UCF is very high, and Dylan Gabriel coming off a great freshman season. Oh, yeah, I'm excited to play with Dylan this year. So where are you from exactly? It's a town called Vacaville, California. 
Okay, so you went to high school. You grew up there? Yeah, I grew up all four years there. Um, out of high school, went to Santa Rosa Junior College. I, I wasn't a big fan, just wasn't for me, so I switched over to Sac City, and obviously that was a big-time uh, decision because I'm going to UCF now. So what made you decide to go the, the junior college route instead of trying to get in on a D1 team originally out of high school? Well, my senior year, um, my quarterback had been injured. He had a big knee thing, and uh, he got a scholarship to Nevada. He's actually the starting quarterback for Nevada right now, Carson Strong. But um, he had been injured, and we were a real pass-heavy offense. Then we all of a sudden, we couldn't pass, so we had to change up the offense. We start running the ball, and then I hurt my shoulder. I actually sprained my shoulder my senior year. So then I ended up stopping playing football because I just I kept hurting it. So I decided, you know what, probably just stop, uh, see if I can go Juco because I wasn't going to have enough film to go D1 at the time. UCF lists you on the roster at 6'5", 235. Big guy, what's the strength in your game? I'm definitely quick and fast. I don't think anybody's going to be able to guard me because I honestly think I've almost perfected my route. And that's like the the key point in my game, for sure. And then uh, I'm going to have to – I've never had a tight end coach, actually, so I'm going to have to work on blocking a lot. And I'm hoping Coach Gullis is going to show me that technique I'm sure he will, so we'll see how the season turns out. What was it like to visit UCF? Man, I loved UCF. It was honestly breathtaking. I've never seen anything like it. The school's huge. There's so much support at the staff. I can't even put it into words, really, but the team's awesome, too. Uh, the way they train over there, it's like elite, and I'm really excited to see that because it's going to perfect the really low points of my game. So I think all overall, uh, go a lot better. What is the high point? What is the thing that, that you that you can do that nobody else can do? You can put me in the backfield, and I can run a route from the backfield. I can motion out to wide out. I can run a route. I can line up in the three-point stance, run a route. You can put me anywhere. I can run a route on anybody. All right, sounds good. You said that you really liked UCF. Were the, the facilities and things like that, was that... Something that was like you know exciting to you? Did they, did you like what they had to offer as far as that stuff goes? Well, I don't know if you guys have ever been to a junior college, but um, there's really not a lot there. You get a weight room with weights that are like 15 years old, maybe 10 years old, something like that. You got to pay for your clothes. You got to do all this. Got to do all that. When I got to UCF, it was like I got this trainer who's gonna look at my body fat, look at uh, how much mass I had, what it would be healthy to be, what weight, um, what weight I'd be running at the quickest. And then, I don't know, it just, it, there's a lot more that goes into how my body is going to be when I play. Zach, who else were you uh, considering before UCF came into the picture? Uh, so I had one other offer from University of Texas, El Paso, and I'd gone on a uh, visit there the week before. And that was pretty nice, but Obviously, uh, UCF blew me away, so I had to take the offer there. You mentioned the weight room. Are you much of a gym rat? You see opportunity to really grow in that area? I love working out. It's honestly one of my favorite things to do. Not just working out, but running. I'm really about fitness. I like to I like to compete, too, and I believe while I'm fit, I can compete with anybody. Right on. Did the guys that are currently playing in the NFL play any part of, of you considering UCF? You know, the guys that are fairly well-known out there? You mean like the Griffin brothers and all them? Yeah. I mean, you can see that people go to the NFL from UCF. Was Did that play a part? Uh, not really, because I think I'm going to go to the league anywhere I go. Okay. I just really thought the school was... Um, I really thought the school was for me, and everything that was there was for me. Who do you look up to in uh, professional football? Is it a tight end or other position? Definitely tight ends. I've been compared to a lot of tight ends, but I'd say my favorite by far is George Kittle because I'm a Niners fan, of course. But, I mean, I love the way he plays. He's got so much passion and heart, and that's what I want to bring to the table at UCF. All right, that's good. I was hoping you would say Travis Kelsey, but uh, that's, that's a, I'm from Kansas City originally, so I'm a huge Chiefs fan. So <laughs> Yeah, we got uh, cheated in the Super Bowl. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was coming. I knew well, it was you're coming. now Andrew's favorite player you're on my, the 2020 yep, team. Yep, yep. <laughs> we'll be talking more about that. All right. When do you get to UCF? Uh, May 21st, I believe. So my sem- the semester... 
ends May 20th, and then I'm supposed to be on a flight the next day. Are you ready for the, the, that transition 3,000-plus miles away from family and friends and new surroundings? I can honestly say I've been training for this for a long time now, and I'm ready. What's your major? So I want to be a firefighter. And there's not um, fire technology or fire science there, so I'm thinking business administration. Okay, well, I have a degree in fire science, too, so we have a couple things. All right, you're back on Andrew's good side. Yeah, you're on my good list again. Yep, you're on my good list again. All right, so uh, Night Nation is listening. They listen to this show. If you could say anything to Night Nation, the, the entire fan base, what would it be? We're winning the championship next year. <laughs> All right. That's good. Okay. Just want to mention you're active on Twitter at Zach underscore W-O. So give uh, Zach a follow, interact with him, and he'll be here and join in Night Nation soon enough. Awesome. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing you out on the field. And I, I cannot wait till you see uh, the bounce house full and screaming. It's it's crazy. I don't think you've ever yeah. experienced anything like it before. I've heard all the stories, the beams shaking, the whole crowd shaking. So, yeah, I'm really excited about that, too. It's awesome. I'm excited for you. So, all right, man. <laughs> really, thank you a lot. We appreciate it. Ha- have a good evening. Man, thank you, guys. Have a good night. All right, time for a little Knights in the Pros. Uh, Rennell Hall left the Vipers game with an injury, so we'll see what uh, happens with him. Shoulder injury. Shoulder injury. Hit on a return. Uh, Too bad for him because he uh, hadn't really gotten in there that much until then. So, Uh, And then you were over there at the Vipers game, um, and you were able to talk with Terrence Plummer that had a sack uh, in this last game, and you caught up with him after, and here is that. First reaction to this loss, close, but uh, just couldn't get over the hump. Man, honestly, we scored today on offense. Defense, we didn't do as great as we have been doing, but we did hold them below their averages. I'm looking at it as, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't think about losses as in, in terms of like, you know, moral wins or anything like that. We lost today. In professional football, you can't lose, but we right here. And if we just keep working how we've been working and keep going how we've been going, it's going to break for us. I truly believe it. I know my teammates believe it. We just got to believe. We right there. We're not a bad team. We're just as talented as anybody else in this league. We just got to limit our penalties, limit our mistakes. I know I made mistakes out there today. I wish I could take back. But at the end of the day, I know I know what we got in here. And I know what type of guys we are. And, I, and you've seen it today. We had the number one team in the XFL, supposedly, you know, on the ropes with a chance to win. It's okay. You know, it's a long season. Got seven more opportunities. Let's just make the best of our seven opportunities coming up and just keep working. What was the mood of the locker room and what did Coach Trestman right, say team. right after the game? The game, bro. He was just telling us, you know, um, don't lose your focus. Just keep working. Stay, stay, stay present. You know, we lost today, but you fought. We fought hard. Sometimes it's gonna come like that. We started off 0 three, but we faced a lot of adversity early on. A lot of people haven't faced adversity, but adversity builds a lot of character as long as we stick together. And that'll come to play when it's time to, you know, make a run for the playoffs. It's early in the season. We still, we still got everything we're looking forward to in our uh, season to go for us. You know, 0 three, that's nothing. I've been down many times before. We all have been. That's why we're in the XFL. It's just about who's gonna fight through it. Take us through the sack. Um, it was a. Uh, I seen the running back out there. I, I, fi- I figured the way it was set up. If I came outside, I wouldn't never make it. But I did see a little opening in the a gap. Um, Josh Banks did a good job of clearing it out. And I just came under. I saw PJ about to take off, and I, you know, I, I ran to him and got a good set. What's that celebration after you get that sack? Is that hey, a little man. bit of a snake thing you got going on there? Yeah, um, Nikita Whitlock started it. I saw Josh Banks do it earlier. Um, it's, you know, it's like, you know, we the, we the Vipers, so we, we like to yell slat a lot, you know. That's our little thing, slat, you know. Just, just you know, Vipers are aggressive. They're strong. They're fast, you know. They're venomous when they hit you and they hurt. So that's just our little thing, just showing a little love, a little snake bite. What was it like to play finally before a home crowd? Felt good. Um, I had like 30 people here. My family and friends, my, my my beautiful fiance was here, my beautiful mother was here, my aunts, my uncles, uh, my cousins. So it was lovely to have that. I wish I would have. I wish we could have came out with a win today, and uh, but we showed that you know we gonna fight. 
and uh, we got another opportunity this next Sunday. We're going to clear this. You know, you can't ever go back in the past. All we got to do is move forward. I'm going to make sure that I'm working hard, and I'm going to bring along as many guys as I can so that we can continue this hard work so next week we get a new, new outcome. You mentioned you faced adversity before. This team's down 0-3. What has it got to do to get that first W next week? Just keep working. We just got to keep putting in the work like we have. You see we're getting better and better every week. Offense is moving the ball. They finally hit the end zone. We're here next Sunday uh, at 7 o'clock. You know, defense, we kind of took a step back today. But we also went against one of the best uh, offenses in the league. So, you know, we got a little blood in our mouth. So, you know, next time we're going against another good offense. And so we got to come out here ready to work, ready to grind. And uh, that's what we're going to do. Next week, UCF opens spring practice early, February okay. 28th. Can wow. you believe that, huh? No, man, no, man. That was still the time we was working out when I was there. So, uh, you know, good luck with those guys I love. You know, I'm a knight for life. I love what they're doing out there. Coach He Um, Those guys, uh, you know, last year, it's crazy. I say this, we went 10 games. We went 10 games and it's a down year for us. So, you know, I'm ready for those guys, you know, keep picking it up, doing what they do, winning the conference, and uh, good luck to them. How good do you think that D can be this year? They got how many guys coming back? A lot. A lot? <laughs> yeah. Hey, man. You know, we built on defense at UCF. You know, we done had some good offensive teams these last few years, but defense is something that's been our calling card. I just want those guys to remember, like, right now is, is a vital time in their lives and recognize that there's no better time than being in college, playing Division One football, the school being paid for, the food being paid for, them being taken care of while getting the education. And these, are, these guys right here are – their teammates are like their brothers because they live with them in the dorm. So if they can just recognize that this is a special opportunity, their defense can be great. You mentioned fiance. How are those wedding plans coming along? <laughs> They're coming good, man. They're coming good. I get married in May. Um, I'm so thankful for it because, you know, we, we had to move the wedding originally because we originally had it planned on the first day of our game. So we didn't know, you know, I didn't know XFL was coming along. I was in the CFL. I, had, I was hurt last year. So, um, they're coming good. You know, we got a lot of people trying to come, so we're trying to weed it out. But uh, You may be a little bit distracted, though, with football practice and games. Right so now. Fiance is taking the load on all yeah, of those plans. Her, 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 my mama and her mother-in-law, you know, they doing their thing. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to handle what I got to handle, but I want to help her too. I know it's hard, so I, I try to I try to help when I can. Oh, and three, but your message to the fans: don't give up on the Vipers. Don't give up on us. I promise you, because if you give up, you're gonna miss something great. I have a I, have, I, I I don't know a lot about this world, but I do know one thing about these Tampa Bay Vipers: we come to work, we love football, and as long as we keep working and keep doing what we do, and we just lock in even more, and even more, we're gonna win, and we're gonna win big. All right, Tampa Bay looks for its first win on Sunday night, March 1st, when the Vipers welcome the D.C. Defenders. They definitely need to uh, to win over there. What was the experience like over there, Trace? Rowdy crowd, 18,000-plus. Uh, Vipers lose 34-27 to Houston. They get a D.C. team that's getting thrashed in L.A. So they LA were Houston we'll fans, right? They were Houston no. fans? Oh, no. No. Really, no. a lot of overlap with the cows. Still a little getting used to seeing Quentin Flowers and uh, that uh, puke green color they wear. But uh, fans seem to have a good time, even in defeat. So good. good. There's yeah. always there's always beer to drink. There was a lot of beer flowing in the end zone. Okay, well that's good because yeah, I I don't I still don't know if I can root for that team. I, I really... I'm rooting for Terrence, Rennell, I, I'm, I, and Jordan. I, yeah, I want to root for them, <laughs> but there's just so much that is... Uh, I, I don't know. I really haven't gotten into this whole XF, XFL thing like I thought I would. I think that that has a lot to do with it. There's not a lot of our players on the other teams. They're all on that one team. They wear the puke green. They play in that stadium. Dallas has got Tony Gerard, so Yeah, there is the one. I mean, Flowers is a great football player. Great football player. He is. I can't root for him. I have trouble rooting for him, even though I find myself rooting for him over the Georgia kid. Uh, but oh yeah, over Aaron Murray. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a fan. He Who's was a chief hurt. for a little while, and blah blah blah. What's funny is, I guess in some ways, if the Vipers flame out in Tampa, I wouldn't mind seeing them move him to Orlando. No, that would be great, and put him in a different color. I mean, they would have to change yeah. the whole uniform. They could keep the snake thing, uh, if they so desired, right? So. Black and gold would look really good on a snake. I'm just <laughs> yeah. saying. Black and gold would look great on a snake, they and just... then we'd, we have and they could play at Bright House Networks or whatever it's called now. <laughs> <What> are... <laughs> Spectrum. Let's check. Uh, oh, still that. <laughs> Spectrum. Could, uh, Spectrum. I called it that earlier today, too. There, it could be... You never know what it could be called at this point. 
It's not Andrew Fegley Field, that's for darn sure. I, I, I'm still pushing for SpaceX Field. That would be huge. Yeah, yeah. that would be awesome. Yeah. And then, you know, we could they could specifically launch some rockets during our games. So instead of kickoff at 7, liftoff at 7. There you oh. go. <laughs> we could have our space game sponsored by, you know, SpaceX. Every game's a space game. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that would be awesome. All right. Well, uh, Elon Musk, if you're listening, I listen to your podcast. So why are <laughs> you listening to It's the least you could my... do. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to any podcast that you're on, my friend. Oh, boy. We we don't stack up with Joe Rogan, unfortunately. <laughs> well, slightly but, behind. Yeah, a bit. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Nightline Zone seven footer Ben Big Social Stout and Inside the Paint. It was definitely a tale of two games for men's basketball this week. The thrill of victory with a double overtime classic in Cincinnati, 89-87 Knights in that one. Then, the agony of defeat when the Knights blew the lead and lost 75-74 to Tulane. That loss dropped UCF to 5-9 and in league play, 14-12 and overall. Let's talk about it with former UCF men's basketball player Ben Stout, who is in the paint and on the Nightline hotline. Ben... Let's say that going into this week, we would have hoped for maybe a one and one. We would have just reversed who would have been the game that UCF won and which one they had lost. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, uh, I, I mean I've really uh, going back to last week. Uh, we certainly were thinking that this could be a probably a, it was easy to predict a one and one week for UCF. But you're right, we uh, certainly wouldn't have predicted the way that one and one shook out. Um, I don't. I mean, even my heart of hearts didn't really expect them to go into Cincinnati. The main thing I and get that win. Um, the main thing I was looking for when they went into Cincinnati was just to show um, what we had seen at times, but but not seen consistently, and just that kind of fight and that grit. And um, you know, when you go in against a team like Cincinnati that is just so physical, and um, you know, it really takes the takes the fight at you uh, that's that's what i was looking for out of our guys and boy did they ever show that um you know got off to a little bit of a slow start at cincinnati and uh, and and then tony johnson jr came in and just gave this team a huge lift and that overall um was i think one of the more exciting ucf sporting events that happened this season this year and uh in UCF sports. I mean, just to go into that environment, double overtime against the top team in our conference and, and be able to kind of gut out that win after all the adversity was, um, was really something special and, and one that we can kind of look back on as, as easily the best win of the season. And it's just, it's, it's just, uh, it's just unfortunately this week has been a microcosm for our season because we followed up with what was a kind of an epic collapse um, at home against Tulane. Um, and so it was a, it was kind of a strange week, but uh, I guess we should be get, getting used to that by now with this season of UCF basketball. We got an Ask Nightline question from Matt Golden Knight underscore the second, who is always good to uh, write to us each week and asked, would you say the extremes, the hot, cold performances have been most perplexing to watch this year? Probably an understatement, but I got to tell you, I'm not particularly surprised. I mean, the Knights were projected ninth in the American and they've never been able to string together much in the way of uh, momentum or a win streak. So I'm not entirely surprised that they follow up what was a tremendous performance at Cincinnati with really a game once again, they let get away. Yeah, I mean, on on Saturday against Tulane, it, it just it kind of felt like in that second half that we were showing that we were the better team, but by the same point, we were letting them hang around. And this season, when we let a team hang around, um, that we are quite frankly better than, um, or at least playing better than for the most part, but we're just kind of letting them stay in the game. I mean, that's always that's always spelled a little bit of a disaster for us this year. And so I think that while, while the up and down season may not have been totally surprising, it probably is more surprising after the 
kind of great start that we got off to in the non-conference, but um, just overall, just the way that this season has gone since um, the the clock turned over to 2020, it's just been um, it's been completely up and down, and, and unfortunately been kind of inconsistent overall it's been kind of the theme the one word theme of this season is just inconsistency in my opinion and and we've had to battle through a lot we've had we've obviously had the extreme amount of turnover on the on the year going from last year's magical year and then um we got a player that's been a huge contributor in dre fuller you know go down for the rest of the season battled through an injury almost the, almost the full season. And so we kind of missed a piece there. And, but I don't want to make any excuses for our guys. Uh, we, but we, we had to battle through a lot. And, and hopefully what we do in these last few games of the year will hopefully set us up well and, and hopefully the, set us up well for a, maybe a couple of surprises in the conference tournament and just kind of finish this year strong and looking forward to next season. We've had opportunity to talk quite a few times about the performance of Darren Green Jr., but not as much Tony Johnson Jr. 47 minutes at Cincinnati, 21 points, a team high. What is it you like about his game and what he could mean to the Knights over the next couple of seasons? Yeah, the kid just shows a lot of poise and a lot of kind of he's got a lot of intangibles about him. I just I like the way he carries himself on the court. He just he, I was talking about this this morning that he just, it's almost on Nightline the morning after. On Nightline the morning after. <laughs> on ESPN. I, I'm gonna start, on ESPN 580 or later. I'm going to start getting go. better at that. There answer. you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I mean, I was talking about this this morning. It's just uh, uh, talking about the way uh, you, certain point guards, the way they dribble the ball, they almost look like they're pounding the ball through the, you know, through the, the wood on the, on the floor. And that's the way like Tony Johnson dribbles the ball. I, I mean, he, he seems to kind of have total command out there and, and he's just, he's, he's the player that we have been looking for out of a days on Ingram. And even, and he's, a, it says, says is a different player than, um, than Tony Johnson. I, I don't necessarily expect him to be a hundred percent like this, but Tony Johnson just has this air about him on the court where he's, you know, he's pointing to his teammates, he's directing where they need to go, and uh, he just has this confidence about him that, quite frankly, we need from the point guard position, not only this season, but uh, in the seasons to come. And these last couple of games, he showed it at Wichita State, but these last couple of games, he's certainly taking command of our team from that point guard position, and he showed that he belongs on that court at the D1 level, and and he's doing a great job. I, I, I like how he he kind of changes direction real quick. He changes speeds, and he and he knows when to get to the basket or or look for his teammates. Um, he's we could have something really special there in Tony Johnson Jr. And it's just kind of ironic that our three freshmen are all juniors. They're all uh, they're all the. That's kind of a weird statement to say, uh, but Dre Fuller Jr., uh, T- Tony Johnson Jr., and uh, Darren Green Jr. Um, we've all we've got some. Uh, we got some special things there in those three freshmen um, and and all in different ways. So I I think the future is bright. So I'm going to ask the same question that I asked you this morning. And that's basically is Tony Johnson Jr. Or can Tony Johnson Jr. Be our next uh, BJ Taylor, basically? Yeah. I mean, I I don't want to put that kind of pressure on him because I think he's the type of, I think he is, he's, he's had the chance to develop into his own player as opposed to, you know, being compared to BJ, but it's so natural to compare him to BJ, um, not only the position that he plays, but his style of play. And, and Hey, I, I mean, I'll give him credit. He, he, he do- decided to don the number one at UCF, uh, the year after BJ Taylor graduated. And I remember there was a few questions, uh, might've even been from you trace in the, in the beginning of the season, uh, before it even started, you know, saying, uh, you know, what do you think about that? That's a pretty special number here at UCF. And he didn't back, he didn't shy away from it. Um, he didn't shy away from the comparisons. He, 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 you know, kind of stated that he wants to make that number, his number as well. And, um, and so, uh, I think that he's, he's got a chance to be that, well, I mean, we keep saying that word alpha dog. We, I think he has a chance to be that alpha dog that we've been looking for. And what a great compliment 
uh, piece to them with Darren Green. Um, I think those two would just have something special, and they, they really seem to complement each other very well on the court. Um, I, I think Darren Green Jr. played fantastic this this these past two games as well this uh, this week, and so he deserves a lot of credit as well. But certainly this was a coming-out party this week for uh, Tony Johnson. Yeah, and, and what I think is is one of the other people, uh, or one of the people needs to step up and be a leader as well. And, I mean, obviously from the point guard you know position, that's kind of like the quarterback of, of the basketball team. He's kind of in the position to do that. And that's, I think, what this team needs more than anything, is somebody to be a leader. Yeah, as you and I kind of messaged back and forth after we beat Cincinnati, I mean, I, I, I hate to say it because I, I do have a lot of respect for him, but I think Dazon being out with the flu at that Cincinnati game might have been a blessing in disguise. And it's not a – that statement isn't a knock on Dazon. Um, he's he's contributed um, – the best he can this year. But I think that that gave them the mentality of their kind of their backs against the wall and they've got to step up. Someone's got to step up. Someone's got to step up and show that fight. And, um, you know, early on in that game at Cincinnati, uh, Cesar de Jesus, you know, trying his best. He, he did have a few turnovers and, and, and I'll give credit to Dawkins. He he decided to go ahead and let his freshman um, have some extended minutes. Uh, and he brought in Tony Johnson Jr. He took Caesar to Jesus out, and and then and then that and was the won the game. That, I mean, exactly, and won the that game. That was the spark that we needed. He could, I don't think he came out at all after that. I mean, forty seven minutes. There's no way he probably he probably didn't come out after that. Um, and and I, I I believe that he provided us the spark to um, and the command to win that game no i think it's gonna be i think he's gonna be extremely special for some reason yeah. i just feel like he's gonna be really really special mm -hmm. as february I agree with you. turns to march every coach in college basketball across the country men's and women's basketball want to be playing their best basketball now what we saw on wednesday at cincinnati you gave hope to that ucf could be playing its best basketball now only to see that unravel on Saturday, do you still find that with four regular season games to go to this week at UConn at Tulsa, final regular season road trip for the Knights, that UCF's best basketball might simply be in consistency and building some momentum that it can carry from one game over to the next? Yeah, I'd agree with that, Trace. I think that that's what you're looking to see when you're. Uh, this is going to be a tough week. There's two. It's two tough opponents on the road um, that we have to face, and and these are these are environments that you know I think we've won. I think last season was our first time that we ever beat UConn at UConn. I think the only time before that was a was a neutral site game that won in the Bahamas years ago, and then and then obviously at Tulsa. I don't care what sport we're playing, Tulsa at, at their place. Um, it doesn't seem to be an easy place to win, and so. Uh, this is going to be a tough week, and and Tulsa's right up there at the kind of the top of the conference um, as well. They've had a great season. Uh, UConn is UConn. They they kind of had a bounce back year, and so this is going this is not going to be an easy week. But what you're looking for uh, outside of of winning one or both of those games, what you're looking for is to show stretches of that consistency, stretches of of them uh, putting in the effort and doing the right things in the execution. Um, and, and you're just looking for a, kind of some positive growth out of this team, uh, whatever lineup is in there. And so uh, I think that whether or not it, it would be probably hard at this point, I think Tony Johnson Jr. has probably solidified his spot in the starting lineup, if not the just, you know, very high level of minutes um, the rest of the season. Um, and I and I'd like to see that kind of continued growth um, those two freshman guards, and and we kind of finish this thing strong with these these next four games um, to finish out this year and and see if we can surprise a few along the way um, in preparation for the conference tournament. Two home, two away, then the conference tournament in Fort Worth, Texas, and at least for me. I'm looking to the 21, 2021 team already is is what I'm I'm thinking ahead to now. So uh, I'm, yeah. I'm looking for those minutes and that growth out of these guys. I think a lot of these games they've let get away will prove beneficial to them because they'll learn how to win in the future. 
Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that I, I, I'm, I'm excited to, to watch this team play and kind of finish out this season, hopefully strong. Uh, hopefully we don't have any more heartbreakers like we had um, on Saturday. Um, but just looking for them to finish this season strong. And you're right. We've got a lot to look forward to next season. Uh, we, with three juniors that are going to be seniors next year, that are going to be key contributors in, um, and Colin Smith, Cesar De Jesus, and Brandon Mahan, and then you've got those three uh, freshmen that are, are rising to be sophomores, and then we've got a couple of good recruits coming in. Uh, on, on top of that, will be you know more of the youth movement as well. So um, I think next season will be a really strong one for us. This will be uh, hopefully one this this past season, or, or I should say, this season that we're in right now will be one that is full of learning experiences that they can draw from and and really do. Um, build off of in the future he is ben stout at big social 32 on twitter and he always finishes strong on nightline <laughs> thanks ben thanks a lot guys have a good one go knights charge on all right let's continue our look at 50 years of men's basketball as we talk with earl stokes who went to popka high school before choosing what was then ftu time to go down memory lane with a man who played forward 50 years of ucf basketball what do you think of that well, it's kind of hard to believe it when you look back. It just seems like it was yesterday when it was here. But uh, it's changed a lot since 50 years ago. Oh, that's an understatement. Back then, of course, it's FTU. You're right. going to Apopka. What interests you about being a part of this fledgling program and fledgling university at that point? I don't know. I just graduated from Seminole Junior College, and a friend and I were looking around, and we decided to... Uh, that we'd come here, and then things just kind of fell in to uh, Coach Clark coming and us having a, having a team to play on. So now UCF fans are accustomed to home games in a 10,000-seat arena on campus. Take us back then. What were the conditions? Where did you play? Most of the time we played at Winter Park High School. It was a new gym they just built, and they let us use that. We practiced wherever we could. Even had a few days of outside court to practice. But we'd practice at a naval, ca- a naval base. Uh, I forget where, there was a couple of other places that we'd work in a time to practice. So we just never knew. State-of-the-art equipment? Yes. <laughs> What'd you have? Uh, we had a basketball and, and the goals. That was it. And now, as you said, look where the program is. What do you think of this journey uh, as one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, programs uh, at the campus? It's amazing how much you know, how much it's grown and how much it changed back then. They were starting out; they weren't going to give scholarships. They were going to have athletic programs without scholarships, and they soon found that they were going to have to compete. They were going to have to have scholarships, and from there, it just blossomed into what it is today. And what do you make of what it is today? It's a little hard to believe when you sit back and look at it from 50 years ago, how much different it is. Uh, the, the league they're in now that they're playing, you know, it's, it's hard, to, uh, hard to believe. And to take uh, Duke, vaunted Duke, a legacy program in college basketball, right to the brink. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, when you think of those like that and then where you come to, but the school has grown so much and the possibilities and the potential is so much better than it was then. To them have because they couldn't pull in great athletes of that time. You know, I was a 6'2 forward, weighed about 170 pounds in 1970, and we beat most teams. But it was, you just don't find that now. You don't have, hardly ever have a 6'2 guard anymore. And uh, you talk about the, the growth of this program. Where do you think, forecast it out, what can it be? Can you win a national championship in basketball at UCF over the next 50 years? Well, I think with what they have, Coach Clark did an amazing job bringing it through the steps. And to get it where it is, and I think the coach they have now has been around those kind of programs, so that's the next step. And I believe that's where they are now. The, is that the coach they have now is the one that has been there on other programs, and he knows what it takes, so it's a possibility. 
What's it like to see your uh, former teammates again? Well, you you look around at them and you say, I say, I know that face from somewhere, but I'm not sure if that's. So yeah, it, it's it's good, good to reminisce about the old days. All good memories. All good memories. I don't have any that I remember. It's All right, Nightline celebration of 50 years of men's basketball continues on our all new episode. On our next all new episode, I guess when uh, we hear from another one of those original players, what a very thing. cool! Yeah, I, I'm enjoying it. I've really enjoyed getting to know these guys, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to have spoken with them. I want to thank at L Bar eighty seven, who wrote to us on Twitter. A huge shout out to UCF Nightline and Sons of UCF for providing us with quality UCF coverage and personal takes. These guys work full-time jobs, have families, still manage to provide us with great coverage. Thank you and charge on. Had families. Had. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. And Laura also writes, you're my favorite, Trace. So, no, she didn't. Yes, she did. On February 19th. Uh, uh, I have I'm that, blocking uh, her. It's pinned uh, at the top of the page. I'm blocking no. her. I'm blocking her. I like she's blocked. Laura, you're my favorite too. Oh she's, God, that could cause oh, a whole kerfuffle Libby. now. What about Libby? Oh my goodness, I've, oh, I've opened up a it. can of worms you did now. It. Libby, like attack, attack, oh, Libby. No. Thank you, Laura. Uh, just ahead, UCF baseball, as we have mentioned, sweeps the Auburn Tigers. We go in depth with former Knight Kelly Brown. Stay with us. Spice up your company with homemade marketing services from Tasty Gravy Creative. Tasty Gravy serves up a menu of budget-friendly marketing, graphic design, and public relations services customized to your specific goals. Co-owned by a UCF graduate, Tasty Gravy can help refresh your brand, strengthen your online presence, or reinforce your company's message. Contact Tasty Gravy for help with your website, social media, marketing, advertising materials, and more. Visit TastyGravy.com. Hello, Night Nation. This is Andrew Fagley reminding you to tune in every Sunday morning at our new time, 10 to 11 a.m. on ESPN 580 Orlando for Nightline the Morning After. Brought to you by Chad Barlaw. We'll be taking your calls and your texts reacting to the previous week's UCF sports action, and you never know who will show up. Once again, that's Nightline the Morning After, every Sunday morning, 10 to 11 a.m. on ESPN 580 Orlando or TuneIn Radio. Go Knights and charge on. It's a sweep for UCF baseball. The Knights beat the eighth-ranked Auburn Tigers on the road Friday 3-1, Saturday 7-3, and Sunday 12-2. That's a 22-6 run advantage over three games. 34 hits, including 17 on Sunday. UCF 7-1 and one now, with the only blemish, the 6-5 midweek loss to Stetson earlier in the week. Let's talk about it with former UCF baseball player Kelly Brown, who played for the Knights from 1987 to 1991, and who joins us now on the Nightline Hotline. Kelly, how sweet it is. How about those Knights baseball? What do you think? Uh, unbelievable. 125 years Auburn's played baseball. This is the first time a non-conference team has swept them in Plainsman Park. Uh, uh, Got to be great for the confidence of these young Knights. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, you know, it just kind of puts them in the right mindset that they know how to play with anyone. You know, it gives them that confidence that they can go out there and say, hey, we're, we're no worse. They're no better. Bring it on. That's right. Going into this season, we talked about the importance of the depth in the pitching staff. You got to like what you saw from the three starters, Colton Gordon, Trevor Holloway, and Sunday, Joe Sheridan, the sheriff, gets his first win in some 21 months since his injury, the torn labrum. Absolutely. Colton Gordon, he was outstanding. I mean, he, I'm really impressed with him. Um, I'm looking forward to big things from him. Um, and, and everybody really stepped up. You know, uh, Holloway pitched a fantastic game. And then, of course, the sheriff came in today and he did what he does. He scattered out a few hits, but managed the game and, and just got guys out. What do you like about Colton Gordon? Oh, man, he just looks so poised and mature. Um, he's, he's totally in control. Um, and, and just to come in there in a new program and just step on the mound and, and just take over as the, you know, basically the ace right now. I mean, he's the Friday night starter. So to come out there like that and then take over is just fantastic. I like what you texted me over the weekend in response to going to the bullpen. Jeff freaking Hankinson. They have quite (laughs) a few arms in the bullpen, don't they? 
he has been lights out. That kid is tough as nails, and that's exactly what you want coming in late in the game. You got to have that that bulldog mentality that's just going to come shut shut guys down. And let's just expand more on this pitching. I mean, to hold Auburn to six runs over the three games, and again, UCF does this on the road. Uh, what do you think this says for the rest of the season? Well, like I said before, just that confidence and that mindset to say, hey, we're on the road. We can play on the road. It's a, it's a hostile atmosphere, especially in the SEC. You know, you got the number eight ball club in the nation, supposedly, um, and that we're just as good as anyone, and, and we're not going to be intimidated by anyone, and we're going to come in and beat you. Now, talking about the bats, UCF with 17 hits on Sunday, three guys Wingo, Romano, and Ruiz with four hits apiece. I mean, that's three guys with 12 of the 17 hits, and they're doing it in the middle of the order. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that before. I, I mean, three guys come up with four hits in a game, that's that's just a magical day. I mean, for one guy to have four hits is, is a phenomenal thing, uh, but all three of them right in that middle of that order, that's, that's going to be uh, dangerous for the rest of the year. What uh, most impresses you about the offense, uh, as you saw over the weekend? really just the contributions i mean everybody's getting involved and even if you know some of the guys weren't getting hits um i think between uh you know the freshman brayton um archer i think there was maybe one hit between the two of them but they still they were they were productive they contributed um you had the pinch hitter come in uh taylor who's by the way wearing a fantastic number i already shouted that out at him so he's got to wear that well uh but he comes in and and gets an rbi out of a ground ball which is great so i think everyone's contributing um but i think most of all guys are going to be hot they're going to be cold throughout the year but uh for dalton wingo to really kind of get his groove um that's that's a real bright spot because you know he struggled early on and i was afraid that he's probably trying to carry too much on his shoulders you know he's got a lot of expectations on him and i think that might have caught up with him and and Trace, you know, I texted you. He's got to, you know, guys got to start going the other way with the ball. And when you're in a slump, that's what you got to do. You just got to stay on the plate and go with the pitches. And that's what he started doing in that second game. And look what happened. Just to clarify, utility uh, player Trent Taylor, number five. Why is it that you like that number so much? That was my number. That's the best <laughs> number. You gotta love it. <laughs> I got one here really quick. So I know it's early. This is the eighth game of the season. There's like 50-some games. It, <laughs> yeah. But is this team something different than what we've seen the last couple of years? It seems like, I mean, to go in and knock off Auburn at home, which nobody's done in so many years, is that something special or is that was it just a thing that happened? Well, you know, you can say it's a thing that happened. You can say that Auburn's starting off slow and they got caught off guard. But I think it's just a testament to the character of this team that they're out there ready to fight. Um, they're not easing into this season to see what they're made of. I think they've proved it this weekend that they know what they're made of, and they're not going to they're not going to give in. It would be awesome if this it continues like this, but we've seen in years, you know, past that it it starts off good and and ends really bad or something like that. I mean, I, I hope that that this is what we're seeing, you know, is the real deal. Is what is, That's all I'm saying, really. Yeah, and in the past, it seems like our Achilles heel has been when we get the conference play. That's always seemed to be the, the problem, and I don't know why. Uh, we'll come out out of the gates, just ball of fire, just tearing everybody up, and the conference play, conference play starts, and something weird happens, and we start dropping series, and that can't happen this year. So that's, that's where, the, you know, the real test is going to come in. You mentioned dropping series. Of course, the Knights take the first two, and – in the last couple of seasons, it's been those Sunday games uh, where a lot of times the series is tied 1-1 going into that Sunday game, and then UCF will drop that last game. Here, they clamp down and get the sweep, getting an important Sunday win, and that's now back-to-back -back weekends uh, with sweeps and, of course, the Sunday win. Yeah, and then, of course, you know, the first weekend of Siena, and that's just kind of a tune-up, And unfortunately, to say that. But um, to come into this weekend and into Sunday – um, and they could have easily sat back and say, hey, we got the series win. We're good to go. But no, man, they came out and, and put it to them. And so what's important now going into this week? You've got the midweek game Tuesday at Bethune-Cookman. And then you've got four games with uh, Cal State Northridge uh, coming up uh, on the weekend, including a double header on Saturday. If you're Coach Lovelady, with this momentum, wind in your sails, you return back to Florida. You're just up the road in Daytona Beach, but you've got 
five games within a close vicinity of you. What are you hoping to accomplish this week? Well, I think what they're going to try to accomplish this week on Tuesday is you're going to see uh, a lot of guys get some playing time that maybe wouldn't normally get a lot. Um, you know, Bethune Cookman, their their program has improved immensely over the years. You know, back in my day, they were they were barely even a high school team. They were really bad, and we kind of obliged them by playing them every year, but it, it really wasn't a contest. But over the years, that program has really turned around, and they can play ball. So, again, like I said last week, you can't take teams for granted. You can't sit back and, and just, you know, think you're going to walk out there and beat a team because they don't have a big name or anything. But they really need to stay focused on what they're trying to do, work on the things they need to work on. Um, but, again, you see, you'll see some guys get some playing time that maybe wouldn't normally. And then you head into the weekend against a California team that, you know, they always got talent out there. And then uh, just one more thought from you, how important it is for confidence, especially in the game of baseball. It is a grind. There are a lot of games. Uh, players will get into slumps. What does a series like this do for team confidence? Well, I think the biggest thing is, and this is what I would like for all of them to realize and know, is that, you know, back in the 80s, the Miami Hurricanes, you know, they were the pinnacle of college baseball. And when we played them, you know, they were no better than us, but the only problem was when they put their pants on, they knew they were going to win. And that was the confidence that they had. And that's what we have to have to know, Hey, when we put our pants on in the clubhouse, we're going to win this game. It's over. Um, so they got to go out there with that kind of swagger, really. Um, so this, this series was really huge to give them, give them that boost. Knights swagger and maybe just maybe a top 25 ranking when the new rankings come out this week. We'll see. All right. He is Kelly Brown at Nitro5 on Twitter. Give him a follow and listen to him every new episode of Nightline here on the Nightline Sports Network. Kelly, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. See you next time. All right. The Knights stay on the road, but not far from home Tuesday night at Bethune-Cookman. First pitch at 6 p.m. Then it's back home for a weekend series with Cal State Northridge. Friday at 6, a doubleheader on Saturday with games at 2 and 45 minutes after that game ends and Sunday at 1. All right, what a weekend for UCF softball. The Knights were perfect in Tampa, run ruling the SEC's Tennessee Volunteers 10-1 Friday, 9-1 Saturday. SCC overrated after UCF beats them in baseball, Auburn, and softball. Uh, the two win they added two wins over FIU, UCF 13 and 2 on the young season ties for the best 15 game start in program history listen to this knights have outscored the opponents 102 to 32 so far and that's saying something for the for whatever what was it you said tied best for tied for best to 15 game start in program history they've been very very good before yes uh so that's ding dong you know i mean that that's something special there for sure uh senior pitcher leah white won again moved to seven and one she now has 73 career victories that's just seven wins away from the all-time wins lead in ucf softball history and junior Georgia Blair, fastest ever to hit six home runs. Did so you, six home runs yeah, in 15 yeah, games. That's awesome. Did you like my my uh, homemade sound effect there? Ding dong. No. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's an official that's, that's, an official sounder. Yeah, I'm going to have to get it. Uh, i have to get the recording. Ding dong. All right. All right. Up next for the Knights. By the way, rankings come out. They, like their baseball counterparts, should find themselves ranked. Uh, I mean, it's going to be yeah. crazy if, if yeah. all those are ranked. Now, if basketball could just... No, that's not going to happen. Um, the softball is at ninth-ranked FSU Wednesday, then back home for the UCF Invitational Friday night at 6 against Long Island and Saturday and Sunday with Longwood. I'm Jeff Allen. Join me each and every week on the Nightline Sports Network for the AAC Report. We bring you in-depth coverage of each school in football, basketball, baseball, softball, soccer, golf, tennis, and more, as well as bring you insider interviews and focus in on the biggest games and news of the week. That's all right here each week on the AAC Report, only on the Nightline Sports Network. All right, Jeff, staying busy with the AAC report. No doubt going to have a lot about the topsy-turvy world of the basketball season. Uh, who wants to win this regular season and who's going to be the team to beat in that conference tournament? A lot of teams vying for that. So uh, tune in to Jeff this week. 
Uh, take a look at your Nightline Planner. Template Women's Basketball, that's Wednesday at 6. Track and Field takes part in the American Indoor Championships in Birmingham. That begins Friday the 28th. Also on the 28th, Women's Tennis faces Old Dominion in New Orleans, then Tulane on the 29th. Men's Tennis back in action on the 29th. Funny to say the 29th, by the way, leap year. So you get an extra day It only day happens there. so often. Uh, they have a home match with FAU at 2. Men's Soccer's Spring Slate features a match with Orlando City B at 10 a.m. And Women's Basketball is at Memphis on the 29th. And that mentioned Orlando City opens up on Saturday. Mm. Yeah. Trace, Excitement. How often does the 29th of February come around? Every four years? I don't know. I was is asking right? you. Is that I'm, I'm trying to. Leap year, right? <laughs> yeah. Every four it years. Is. I think it's every yeah. four years. Yeah. Uh, who will be UCF's leading rusher in 2020? That is a question in our Ask Nightline inbox when Nightline number 223 returns. Oviedo Brewing Company is the hottest microbrewery in Central Florida. Located seven miles from UCF at the Oviedo Mall, this 8,800 square foot brewery just opened its doors six months ago and has already crafted 13 unique beer flavors and counting in their tap room. The tap room contains different styles of beverages, including ciders, wines, and craft sodas. Not only do they have amazing beers, they also have a full kitchen with gourmet pizzas, wings, and tacos. Oviedo Brewing has activities for each day of the week, such as Taco Tuesdays, Trivia Wednesdays, Pizza and Pint on Thursdays, plus live music on Friday. Friday and Saturday evening, but the best is Sunday brunch with unlimited beer mosas. Need a spot for game day? Oviedo Brewing is just the place with their large TVs to catch all the live games. You also find Oviedo Brewing at UCF tailgating sampling beers. And OBC support for the Knights doesn't stop there. If you need a spot for UCF away games, come to Oviedo Brewing Company, where the Nightline Sports Crew will be broadcasting live after the game. You can get all the details on their Instagram or Facebook page. Follow them at Oviedo Brewing CO. Download the Untapped app, and you can find out what beers are on tap. The food menu is also available on their website, ovidobrewingco.com. Hey, Night Nation. It's Adam from the Sons of UCF. Be sure to check out our show every Wednesday only on the Nightline Sports Network. Now, back to two guys who probably won't be Cow of the Week nominees, Andrew and Trace. Ask a Nightline is brought to you by Chad Bar Law. Chad is a UCF alumnus and diehard Knights fan. Chad Bar Law handles auto accident, slip and fall, and personal injury cases. Call Chad today at 407-599-9036 for a free consultation. That's 407-599-9036. Armor up and call Chad Bar Law today. All right, time again for Ask Nightline, answering the questions you send to us on our Facebook page or via Twitter at hashtag Ask Nightline. Not a very full Ask Nightline inbox this week. Uh, at WP, Rel Brock 4, I love this, was Auburn motivated? I guess not. Huh? <laughs> well, I would expect them to use the exact same... Uh, this exact same thing against us on Twitter and everything else. Well, yeah, I jawed back and forth for the minute and a half I had interest in this Auburn fan's takes when he said, but did the Peach Bowl or these three games really mean anything? So every time that team loses, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fine. I mean, for them, I guess, if, if it doesn't mean anything <clears throat> when they win or lose, you know, whatever. Um, at Wade H underscore UCF. Should this be one of the questions I ask Coach Heupel? If everything is 100% perfect, when is KZ cleared to play? I think there's a lot of if with that, if everything is 100% perfect. Yeah, I would statement. think at, if everything is 100% perfect, if it happens this season, I think it will be mid-season. Yeah. If. Yeah, it's it's uh, it remains... A big if. A big you know, if, yeah. Unfortunately. Many things can be right at the same time. He's right. made tremendous progress. Right. What's most important is his health and well-being, his ability to walk, and not... For the rest of his life, not just to play football. But yeah. being football ready yeah. is a different hurdle, right, than just walking. And I know we, we, you know, we follow every word and every social media post, and he's fitted with a different brace. It's still a significant injury, so... Yeah, you never know, though. I mean, and that's why I'm saying my prediction is midseason. If if it happens this season, it will be midseason. At uh, Brian W. Peterson, who do you predict will be our leading passer? Uh, that's pretty simple. 
Dylan Gabriel. I concur. Our leading receiver. Ooh, that's now that it, that could be hard. I don't know that it is necessarily de facto Marlon Williams. I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, I think he plays a role, but I think everybody's thinking he's going to make this jump to the Gabe Davis role, and that may I not don't be think so. what yeah. he is uh, slotted. For. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Trey Nixon, maybe, or Josiah's Cradle, maybe. You never know, the big guy. Uh, could... And when he says leading, does he mean yards? Does he mean touchdowns? But, you know, yeah. you could be some different things there. It's you true. could have touchdowns, but maybe not the yardage or vice versa. It's true. You know, true. Leading tight end. Woj! I'm going to go with Woj! Yeah, we'll, we'll go, Woj thinks he's going to be, trust me. <laughs> if you heard that interview, he's a very confident young man. Which is good. I, I like confidence. Very but confident. I do think, and it's a question I asked of Coach Heupel at National Signing Day, and he answered that, you know, you had a special talent in Michael Colubiali, and with some injuries, Jake Hescock and, you know, uh, Jonathan McAllister, that they weren't able to do everything they wanted to do with that position. You can see with the emphasis with the new uh, coach who's really bolstered the, the tight ends when he was at Iowa State, and, you know, and picking up Zach here, uh, you know. You know, I wonder if that played into the decision to get that guy, uh, the the new co-offensive coordinator who I could Goalish. Never, Goalish. Uh, I wonder if that whole tight end thing and, and how he is kind of like a tight end recruiter guru kind of guy, I wonder if that played into Josh Heupel um, getting him because the tight end used to be very prevalent in his system. And it has become not so much. So I wonder if that had anything to do with it. Because we've been talking about it the entire time. I think he's Three been the years. coach. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's um, a wrinkle that could be a part of the offense that we haven't seen. Or it could not. Or it yeah. could be nothing. Yeah. Uh, was there a leading rusher in this? Yeah, Cause you... leading rusher as well. I'm... Oh, and there's some questions. And there was why. Oh, I, I left out the why. I just started. Oh, the... well, we've given a little bit of yeah. why there. I think it, it's time for Greg McRae to come back. I think it is time for Greg McRae. So I'm going to say Greg McRae is going to be the leading rusher this year. And I'm going to say why. It's because he uh, was really unable to perform the majority of the year last year. And I'm sure that he is, is ready to get back and claim his... His thousand yards again. I I really want to see that uh, more than probably anybody on this team. I want to see him succeed like he did before because I think he's truly special. Yeah, that's it. I, I have no reason to not uh, agree with you on on Greg, and I think uh, you know a healthy twelve games of Greg McRae and not missing. What did he miss? Five. He's proven five games. He's proven. He's a proven thousand he's yard rusher. He's elusive yeah. and uh, and. He won't show up in any of these categories, but I expect a, another big year from Otis Anderson. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, will he be the leading rusher? Will he be the leading receiver? I no, don't think but he'll he be either be, one of those, but he will be very, very important. He will be a, a big contributor. Yeah. So, All right. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Hashtag Ask Nightline. And now, news and notes from the world of UCF sports. Women's basketball loses Saturday at 5th rank UConn 66-53. Earlier in the week, the Knights beat the Cows 56-48. K.K. Wright, the Americans' player of the week. Likely, right, the last regular season matchup between UCF and UConn in the American. Maybe they see each other in you know, non-conference play in future seasons. Of course, you still have the conference tournament. UCF uh, on the bubble there for the NCAA tournament. But I'll say this, no one has played UConn as competitively through the years Absolutely. as UCF under Coach A. Absolutely. These games have been very close. UCF 8-5 and five in the American, and they are 16-9 and nine overall. So they need to finish strong and might just get into the NCAA tournament. All right, we're on I-4 rivalry. The season sweep of the Tampa team added three more points to UCF's lead in the war on I-4 rivalry. UCF is ahead of the Cows 33-9. 33 to 9 and I believe 10 points more wins it. Hopefully yeah, I would, would so think soon. that that would be insurmountable for them to um come would back hope. from. Yes. 
14th ranked women's tennis loses 4-3 to 28th ranked Ole Miss. UCF 6-3 and three on the season. However, they will remain ranked. All right. And uh, men's tennis checks in at number 24 in the Oracle ITA team rankings, which remains a program best. Men's soccer, Louis Perez scores two goals. Men's soccer beats Jacksonville 4 nothing in the first match of the spring season. Women's golf finishes ninth at the Moon Golf Invitational in Melbourne. Volleyball, two student-athletes, junior McKenna Melville and freshman Mary Beth Healy, they're going to vie for spots on the U.S. Women's National Team and U.S. Collegiate National Team. Joining the Knights at tryouts at the U.S. Olympic Training Center are three members of the staff, Associate Head Coach Brian Doyen, Director of Operations T.J. Reed, and Volunteer Assistant Lenore Chenard. That's interesting. And finally, 24 UCF students, including two student-athletes, were named to the Order of Pegasus, the most prestigious honor presented to the students at UCF. Congrats to volleyball's Ali Sable and football Kyle Benkel. Uh, undergraduate students are selected based on academic achievement, university involvement, leadership, community service, uh, graduate students additionally are chosen based on uh, publication or research experiences. You like how I included that. I am Icterian. glad that you included that so I didn't have to ask you again. Yes, I, I, I remember that. that that was kind of a big one. That was a stumbling block. All right, this has been Nightline 223. I'm Andrew Fegley. I'm Trace Trolko. Go Knights! Charge on. Victory is our cry, be a CTO, a right to